We're training our sights on the MTA. Yeah, I know it's a really bad pun, but how about we go subterranean with the region's mass transit agency? The point starts right now. Jana Lieber is the CEO and chair of the MTA. I have to talk to you about an earthquake that hit New York City on mm -hmm. Friday um, and the safety of the subways, the tunnels, and the bridges. The reason I asked the question is because we, I think we both know that the Ramapo Fault goes through northern New Jersey, but there are six fault lines in Manhattan, including one that goes across 125th Street, another one that goes down the west side of Central Park and cuts across at 32nd Street. So I guess people are wondering, are the tunnels, the subway tunnels safe? Are the actual tunnels to, you know, New Jersey and the tunnels to Brooklyn and Queens safe? What do you think? Listen, it, uh, it, we the first thing we did fi within five minutes after the earthquake, we were checking the uh, the Queens Midtown Tunnel, the Hugh Carey uh, Battery Tunnel, um, the bridges as well, and there was literally no impacts, no discernible impacts. No, those those investigations continue with engineering professionals, but I got to say, bridges and tunnels are designed for a much higher level of seismic activity than we received uh, in this uh, episode. So. Really comfortable about that. We have teams out doing inspections always of the tunnels, uh, the subway tunnels, and that continued as well. And the crews were under, the operating crews were all under instructions to report any abnormalities. It was, uh, it, was, it was a clean sweep as far as we were concerned. But I've got to ask another question because you do plan, if you get the money, to take the... Um Harlem Line, the Second Avenue subway line, and take it across 125th Street, yeah. which is where the fault line is. Yeah. So will that affect how deep you dig and how you do that if you get the money to do it? It's a smart question. Listen, we're just in the early stages of investigating that. What's happening now is, which is super important, is East Harlem is finally getting a subway line. You know, we promised, all of us New Yorkers, in the 1940s when we started knocking down the elevated trains on 2nd and 3rd Avenue, promised East Harlem that you'd get a subway. That's finally happening now. And, it, and your point, Marsha, which is right, is the next phase after that, and that would be some years from that, might be to take that line across 125th Street from 125th and Park, where this next uh, Which is portion. where the fault line is. Yeah, but you know what? The, the professionals, the geologists, the, the, the engineering professionals will absolutely study the heck out of that, and I'm not concerned that they're going to make dumb choices. If that becomes a project that we all want to do for good reasons, we're going to figure out how to do it safely. And, and, and you would make sure that the lines are fortified oh, yeah. so that they would be earthquake proof if such a thing is possible yeah, you don't you don't de in, in this day and age you don't design a, a structure of that importance that's going to carry people except to be really really resilient to incredible seismic effects that we're there, there, there's not a safety issue that I'm concerned about in that well the next hot topic yeah. is um, is the a marathon and the decision that the MTA originally made to charge the Roadrunners Club $750,000 to use the Verrazano Bridge, which now the governor has said, fix that mess. That's her words, not mine. Yeah. And uh, so what are you going to do to fix the mess? Well, we're going to do what the governor uh, asked us. Now, Kathy Hochul has been Transit Rider's biggest friend, and she plays on a much bigger playing field. You know, I have 70,000 employees. We run the you know, the biggest mass transit system by a lot in the United States. Um, and we're very proud of that. But she plays on a, 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 a playing field of the whole state. So we're obviously going to follow her requests and instructions. Um, but I, I just always want to recognize the staff who initiated this effort are just trying to do what I think is good government work, which just recognizing that um, when there's a situation where taxpayer money um, is being used to, to subsidize an organization like the Roadrunners Club that has 70 million in the bank, 
maybe that's something the taxpayers shouldn't be subsidizing. But the, but the governor has to look at economic development and bigger issues. And this is an iconic event. I've run it at eight times. My daughter ran it at this year. I love the New York City Marathon. Um, and we're going to follow the governor's instructions. So does that mean that you're going to go back to charging them what they charged last year, which yeah, is $150,000? Yeah. yeah, and, you know, if they, uh, listen, they, th there's been a good dialogue. The negotiation was, was far underway, and, and it's possible that the, the discussions might resume in the future. But obviously we're going to comply with the governor's instructions on this, on this one round and, and take it from there. The governor also said she wants the roadrunners to invest in advertising on um, trains and subways and buses. You think that's going to come to yeah, fruition? That was, a, that was a smart point. One of the, the, the parts of the discussion and the negotiation was, we, was the MTA saying to the roadrunners, hey, if you buy advertising on the subways and buses and commuter rails, the MTA gets a slice of that as one way you could make good on this, uh, this cost disagreement. Um, so the governor said that they should look into that, and, and that might be one way of dealing with it in the future. So does it actually cost the MTA $750,000 to let the roadrunners use the bridge for the half a day or whatever it takes? Yeah, I mean, listen, the, it, it's not complicated. It's just that's the revenue that on a normal Sunday, um, the tolls that, that come into the very $750,000 in one day? In normal, on a normal day. Listen, the, 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 we have more traffic than ever in New York. You know that. And I'm sure we're going to talk about congestion pricing. I just um, have a feeling we'll get uh, to that. But, uh, but uh, yeah, the, we're, we're 750000 Good, good news is Staten Islanders get a, a discount on the price of the Verrazano where it's less than a subway ride. But nevertheless, we do take in $750,000 on a normal Sunday, and that was the basis of the discussion that was underway. So what happens to Bike New York, which is a smaller group which uses the, the – the, it's a five-borough bike tour which yeah. uses the bridge to get to the Staten oh, we'll, Island portion? We'll, we'll, f we'll figure that out. I, I, I think that obviously the Bike New York is, is a, less, uh, a less wealthy organization and we're not going to treat them you know, worse than the, the New, York, New York Roadrunners Club. So we'll figure it out in a way that works for everybody. The reason I asked the question is because they said if they have to pay more money, they're going to have to cut some of their programs. One is free cycling. But the bigger yeah. problem is that they have a program that teaches the formerly incarcerated to become bike mechanics so they can get jobs with, the, with City Bike and other bike share programs, and they'd hate to see that happen. All that, it's, all, it's all good stuff. I mean, one of the challenges that we face is there's so many good causes. How do we decide to which ones to fund? through the MTA. The MTA is a transit agency and we're taking taxpayer money and tolls and fares to fund transit. We shouldn't be the decision makers on which organizations get money. There are a lot of good causes in New York. That's, that's where all this is coming from. But for the time being, we're standing pat and, and obviously going to do what Kathy Hochul wants us to do. So let's change topics. Yeah. When Andy Byford, the train daddy, was at head of the Transit Authority. He said that he was going to fix the signals yeah. so that trains could run closer together and so you could run more trains and relieve overcrowding. So that was before COVID, which is at least four years ago, and it seems like the trains are still overcrowded. So where are we in terms of re-signaling so that we can have more trains and less overcrowding? So listen, it's a great question. What, what, here's what I want to tell you. Number one, the train, you know, the overcrowding on subway trains is way down since before COVID. We're thrilled that we have 80 plus percent of our yeah, subway. Yeah, but with congestion work. pricing, you're going to get more people. You no, know. let's talk about that in a second. But right now, we're, we're, here's where we are. We're, we're r roughly 80 percent, and we do. We have more service than we had before COVID. That, thanks to the budget that the the governor engineered last year in Albany, we are actually running more service and it's better service. We have the best service in a dozen years. So that's great. But the point that re you're making. Resignaling. Resignaling. Great point. That is a big piece of our capital program and it's actually being funded in large part by the revenues from congestion pricing. I knew we'd get to that. So, um, but you asked the right question. What, what signals, a little, sounds a little exotic, but what it does is that modern signaling allows more trains to run safely closer together um, and that the, the computer knows exactly where they are and how to slow them down. So we want to make more of those investments. We have it on the L train and the 7 train and lo and behold, those are by far the two most reliable lines. We've now almost finished putting it on the Queens Boulevard line, the E, the F, uh, the M and a little bit on the R and those, those are about to get dramatically better. The A train project, though, is getting killed by the delay in congestion pricing. One reason we got to get it going. 
what about the Lexington Avenue lines? People are that's clamoring for that. You know, it, it, and actually, the, since the Second Avenue subway came in, um, the Lexington Avenue line crowding, in addition to the fact that ridership was a little down from pre-COVID, is uh, is much better than it used to be. We have newer trains, newer signals there. The, 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 cons the trains that we're most concerned about, the lines we're most concerned about, what we call the I and D, those are the letter trains. That's where we got to get the signaling going. The A train is a top priority. Okay, we're going to have to leave it right there for now, but we'll be right back and we will talk about congestion pricing. We're talking about trains with MTA boss John Lieber and now the long-awaited conversation about congestion oh, pricing. Interesting. Here's the thing. Yeah. The suit, the hearing in New Jersey, yeah. which has the most possibility of hurting congestion pricing, is now over. The judge says he's going to rule hopefully before June. Now, th the thrust of the suit was that there are communities in New Jersey that are allegedly going to suffer from pollution, and they want money to, re to compensate the communities for whatever is going on. My reaction was sort of like, since you've made arrangements to mitigate pollution in parts of New York, why not just get rid of the suit and give them some money to mitigate the congestion concerns, if there are any, in the New Jersey communities? No, you know, you, you, you're not wrong. We always plan to do that. But what, the way that this process worked out is the Bronx had a concentration of what they call environmental justice communities. A lot of it around the South Bronx, where the, the, the development of the Cross Bronx Expressway, remember in the Robert Moses era, this is a community that had so much impact, uh, negative impact from transit and air quality issues. And they were really, really concentrated. There were a lot of them. So we started to address those at an earlier stage. And what, what came out in the, in the discussion earlier this week at, at court is, unlike New Jersey, there are people in the Bronx in the environmental justice community who are ready to, to work that out. New Jersey had fewer environmental justice census tracts and it was, they were moving around in the modeling, the computer modeling. So we said, we'll, when those settle down, when it's clear which communities are going to be impacted, we will address those with mitigation. So that will be part. That has always been the plan. That, so that, that, that aspect of New Jersey's suit, I think, was wrong. The other point that I think is important to bear in mind here is the things that are being proposed for the Bronx actually benefit New Jersey. Um, deeper discounts for overnight so the trucks come in and do their deliveries overnight those are the same trucks that come from you know go through new jersey as the ones that go through the bronx um the the whole program to invest in getting trucks throughout our region to switch from diesel to electric benefits everybody so there were real benefits for new to new jersey from the investments that were being contemplated that were portrayed as bronx investments but that said we want to work with New Jersey and get mitigation for the communities that are impacted. That's always been the plan. So how long do you think it will take to find out whether or not the, and where the communities are that are going to be impacted? I mean, couldn't you see that in your initial environmental impact study? And couldn't you have um, avoided this whole co contretemps with New Jersey by making allowances in the original plan? You know, plan? The, 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 it's, it's a little technical, but the bottom line is it had to wait. The final model, computer modeling, that would tell you which traffic intersections and which neighborhoods and which roadways are going to be affected by getting more traffic had to wait for the final tolling structure to be identified. We did that in the last few weeks. Now it's being modeled. It's going to be soon that we'll be able to finalize that, make a proposal to the Federal Highway Administration and they get to decide whether we have addressed and mitigated the impacts properly in keeping with the prior ruling that the feds ruled there was no significant impact from what we were proposing to do after the 4,000 pages and three years of work we're going to see whether they still agree after we do this final analysis. So what happens if the judge comes back and says, we need to do another environmental impact study? That, that, that is a risk in any litigation, but we're confident. Listen, you know, we, 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 we followed every step that the feds told, the, the, the federal agencies who have jurisdiction here, the Federal Highway Administration, part of USDOT, and the EPA is part of that as well. We followed every step. We wrote a 4,000-page document. We did countless computer modeling analysis, which take weeks and weeks and weeks. 
we're pretty sure that we have followed the law to a T. And we're about to find out whether, you know, that every last aspect of it is satisfactory under the law, but we are confident that this meets the test. So one of the arguments that the New Jersey people made was that this was an MTA cash grab. But I wonder if you think that their focus on the environmental impact is a cash grab for them and might be used to help their troubled, I should say, very troubled uh, transit system. Listen, there's no question that New Jersey's transit system has struggled and that it hasn't received investment. One of the, th the great things about my job is that I work for a state and a governor that is passionate about transit and prioritizes it in, 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 in allocating resources. The governor, Hochul, stepped up hugely. The MTA was looking at coming out of COVID at a $3 billion annual budget deficit. She solved it with the legislature. New Jersey, they haven't really been able to address it, and they have significant budget gaps. But as far as what New Jersey wants out of this, I'm not calling anybody a cash grab. You know what? When people say the MTA, the big bad MTA is doing a cash grab, you know what it is? It's so that we can run more service or run service at all, buses, subways, commuter rails, so that we can pay, you know, 70,000 middle class New Yorkers. It's so that we can keep the system in state of good repair so when there's an earthquake, it doesn't fall apart suddenly. Cash grab is, a, you know, is an accusation that's kind of missing the point. This is all for investment in public transit. So part of this whole discussion in Albany now is that a number of lawmakers would like to see an increase in the pilot program that you did allowing one free bus line in every borough. They'd like to see three free bus lines in every borough. Your thoughts about that? Listen, I, 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 I've been honest with you know, the folks in the legislature are pushing this are friends of transit they are pro transit and they're great you know they're they've been great partners for us i have reservation the mt has reservations about free bus um expo uh, gra expanding the free bus system because there is definitely some confusion coming out of COVID. For a long time during COVID, we weren't charging on buses because we wanted to protect the drivers and everybody got off the back, on the back. And then fare evasion exploded on buses. $700 million. Yeah, we have a, what was a $200 million problem before COVID, which was too much to begin with, became a $700 million program, a problem pretty quickly. And Marcia, you and I have talked about it. You're a bus rider. All of a sudden, people who play by the rules all over in the rest of their lives are getting on the bus and they're not paying. And the drivers, in fairness, when I was a kid, they'd say, hey, come on back. You owe me a nickel, right? In the old days, that doesn't happen anymore because drivers have gotten attacked. So we, we can't stop, con start, continue. We cannot continue confusing people about fair payment. I respect the folks who have proposed it. They are pro-transit and they're trying to help people. But so far, the free bus experiment, there is a growth in ridership, but our analysis so far, and it's still underway, is there are not a lot of new riders. There are people who are, com you know, who are coming from other lines or other ways of getting around. I'm not sure that it's worth how much it costs to continue exploding the confusion about fare payment. The legislature said it would cost about $45 million. Do you think the $45 million could be spent other ways? Uh, yeah, but what I want to do is I, I'm in the transit business. I want to grow service. So I want to we've expanded subway service on 11 subway lines since the budget last year, which gave us that money. I want to grow subway service, make it more frequent. I want to make sure there are more buses um, out on the streets, although part of the challenge with bus service is it's not how many buses you have there. It's whether the congestion is clear. We got to deal with that how, congestion. And how, how fast they come. Exactly. The how fast they come because all of a sudden if they're backed up in traffic, they don't get where they're supposed to be in time. So there are a bunch of things going on. One of them is congestion pricing. The other is we need more bus lanes. The other is automatic camera enforcement. Cameras on the buses. You block the bus lane. You get a ticket automatically like driving too fast through a school zone. We really have to focus on buses, not just the number of buses, but how quickly they can get around. Well, we're going to have to leave it right there for now, but our conversation continues right after the show on our streaming channel, CBS News New York. Thank you for joining me. Congestion pricing is coming down the tracks, but many New Yorkers worry about the impact on their lives. They're weighing in on your point. How will congestion pricing impact your life? Uh, 
that won't be coming to the city much at all. Well, I guess I'll have to pay a little extra for my taxi rides and um, Uber Lyft rides. Every time I take an Uber, every time I take a taxi, it's going to cost me a lot of money. It doesn't impact me, but I feel for the ones who it impacts. I currently am not uh, driving in the city. I'm just taking the train, but I think that's kind of insane. Is now a good time for congestion pricing? No, probably not. There's too much, too many other negative things going on in this city, in this state. We want to encourage people to come into the city, don't we? Or maybe we don't. People are still trying to come out of the COVID situation. It's hard to say, but I think it's, I think generally it's a good move in centre of cities for uh, making it a bit more walkable, a bit more public transport. Is now a good time in the city for congestion pricing? It's never a good time to ask people for money they don't have. Good point. <laughs> so will charging drivers $15 get cut down on traffic? Uh, I can't say for sure. We'll see. I don't know. I really hope so. Not at all. It's hard to know. You can only figure that out after you try it and count. I actually think it might, but I just think it's kind of insane. Yeah, it will. I think on the on the on the edges. You have to go to your job. Sometimes you don't have a choice. This is America. People um, uh, try to save money. Um, uh, it's you, you hit their pocketbook and their behavior will change. It will stop a little bit of the luxury driving. I think. Do you think congestion pricing will help or hurt New York City? I think it'll hurt New York City. It's going to help. Oh, it's definitely going to hurt. It's definitely going. It's hurting now. As a New Yorker, I don't like it. How come? Because I don't think it'll help. I think at the at the end of the day, it's all about supply and demand. And if you increase the prices, then obviously the uh, demand will probably. Uh, be reduced and there'll be less cars. New York City's built strong. I think it's going to continue to thrive regardless. People will always find a way to do what it is they need to do and at whatever cost. The more we cycle and take public transport, the better the city's going to become, the more European it's going to feel. New York as a whole is having monetary problems, especially on the, on the you know, citizen level. So it's going to be worse. It's always going to get worse before it gets better, but I never see better.